Right, well, good evening. I'm David Anderson, uh, a retired doctor. I live in Italy, and one of my obsessions is um, the Hongshan culture, and a sub-obsession I'm going to tell you about tonight, which is this um, unique natural glass, which is quite extraordinary. Um, and um, I've got a, a conflict of interest. I've got a large collection and a book on Neolithic Jade, which is going at a knockdown price, and I engage in very strong com gross confirmation bias. But in that respect, I'm just a normal human being. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk first of all about the Hongshan culture, a little bit, and Shui Jing glass carvings. This is called, they, the Chinese call this Shui Jing, which, uh, and the evidence that it's still being mined in China and then uh, I'm going to go up, uh, give you a crackpot theory of the origin of this glass, which, which is definitely highly conjectural. So there are some very confusing terms here. The Chinese use the term Shui Jing for quartz and also silica glass. They don't really seem to distinguish between the two because they're both silicon dioxide. Um, but they're very important, and I'll come back to this, uh, the difference is important, we'll come back to this a bit later. Now, the Hongshan culture dates back to 3,500 to 2,000 years before the current era, BC. And it's based in Liaoning in Inner Mongolia, and was a jade carving, they were a jade carving people, who later, I postulate and produce some evidence on the table here and elsewhere that they learned how to carve Shui Jing glass. This would have been very difficult, but they were undoubtedly a highly sophisticated nephrite jade carving culture already. Now, we're talking here about, um, <coughs> there's Beijing down to the south, and on the top left you see the Mongolian border, and just to the right of that bight, is uh, th that area, down as far as Shenyang, is the Hongshan culture area. I mean, we don't know the margins of it. But, um, uh, uh, and as I said, this is 5,500 to 4,000 years ago. Just to, for those that missed my talk in November, these are, these are jade, nephrite jade sculptures uh, illustrated in the book. Most of my book is about nephrite jade, but there's one chapter on the glass. Um, and these are mostly pendants, beautiful, variable uh, jade, which were, about 10, 15 years ago, going for next to nothing, um, uh, if you knew where to look. But they're not, they're not really available now. So I want to talk about some extraordinary features about, of shading glass carvings. The variety of colours, which is colourless, red, blue, opalescent, and there are examples of all of those here, Extraordinarily low price. I mean, obviously, um, I, I mean, I bought most of my collection on eBay. Massive size of the largest. They, in my opinion, have ho authentic Hongshan iconography. And then we'll talk about uh, tubes, of which, again, there are a couple of examples here, and the structure of the glass and the evidence that it's a pure natural glass. It could not possibly have been synthesized. These are examples of clear... Um, Hongshan, clear, clear uh, silica glass, uh, beautiful iconography. Um, the scratches in the fish in the middle are not actually scratches, those are air bubbles uh, under the microscope. But you notice double figures. Uh, this piece here is a typical Hongshan icon of, of what's called a pig dragon or zhulong, but on its back is a cicada. So they often use mixed iconography. Um, again, a double figure here. The, the, uh, 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 not, interestingly, top centre is a horse, and that's really been worn. That's almost worn, worn away. Uh, this is a sort of evidence that this was, in fact, a Mongolian culture <coughs> and not a northern Chinese, not a Han Chinese culture. Um, then we have these uh, 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 streaked red. Um, which is a very common colour for this glass. And you note the, the, the red is not homogeneous in most of these pieces. Um, at the bottom left, you see a, a, a zhulong, another pig dragon, a bird, mixed iconography. And interestingly, quite often in these pieces, you see a bit of 
uh, what might have been the final polishing material in the hole that sort of got jammed in the hole in the middle. There's another example here. Um, the cobalt blue pieces are much more difficult to find. There are, I've got one of some pieces here, but there are very few of those. Um, and um, again, same sort of iconography. And this is four pieces, film photographed from both sides, of these opalescent pieces. And you'll see an example, a very good example there. This, I think, this glass was highly valued because you see that in all of these pieces, and you'll see it very well in the piece on the table, uh, the suspension holes were really polished out. So it was clearly, I mean, this was for somebody very important. Now, this is the biggest pieces are truly enormous. The one on the left is glass, the one on the right is me. Uh, and um, this, 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 I didn't buy this, but it was going for a very, very low price in Beijing. Something like 3,000 US dollars or something like that. I mean, for a big bit of glass, you know. These we did buy, a friend and I, and the tallest of these is a meter. Now, these must have come from enormous spheres of glass, at least a meter in diameter, the biggest. The rhinoceros I put in here because you can, you can see, see him in real life. And it's interesting because we were just looking up earlier, Radu and I, that rhinoceros, the two-horned rhinoceros was actually a, a, a much more extensive in, in the Asian mainland uh, in the past. I mean, it's extinct and you get, it, you get little ones down in Sumatra and that's about it. But he's a rather fine rhinoceros. Now, I want to tell you a, bit, a little bit about unique tubes, which are a real enigma. Uh, I've got some there. And uh, the biggest of these, I mean, I bought a whole lot. I, I, I just couldn't believe my eyes when I saw these. Uh, going, the, 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 uh, the starting price on eBay was $22 a piece. Because you, it, it does add up, you know. But, um, and that means that they were bought by the dealer in Beijing for uh, $11 to give them a 100% markup. That means that they, whoever took them out was, was being paid two or three, you know. I mean, it was, uh, but these tubes are very interesting. There's one there, which is, I think, this piece. The holes in the center, most of them are not circular. Um, this is a triangular hole. Now, you can't drill a triangular hole. You can core it out, or you can ream out an existing hole but um, the holes are quite extraordinary. Um, and they were used to great effect. If you've got sunlight behind, it reflects off the inner, inner flat surface. Um, and this is a sort of effect that you get. This is a, a face of a woman carved on the, on the surface, um, illuminated by this extraordinary flat surface inside. Some of these tubes, are clearly natural because you can't drill oh sorry i thought this was a pointer but it isn't but if you look at the top left you can see that there, there's a hole that peters out there it is in high high power on the right um, this one in the middle has actually got a piece of glass which has fallen away into it when it was still molten so that's not been drilled out and it's not it's not uniform and this one at the bottom consists of about 300 little holes all clustered together. So what on earth were these? But I mean, this is pretty good evidence that the holes were already there and the pieces were then carved around the existing holes. This is just one experiment I did a number of years ago. We got, I got a local laboratory to boil one of these up in, uh, in very, very strong nitric and hydrochloric acid. And the surface material, the staining, the natural color of the glass, is c it's colorless. I mean, uh, unless it's streaked with something, um, that, that, that's the same piece pre and post. And you see there uh, that there are lots of little holes running along the long axis. So, and this is a piece of Libyan desert glass. Now, Libyan desert glass is the nearest uh, approximation to this, to this extraordinary glass. It's pure silica glass, melting temperature more than 1600 centigrade, no additives and no modifiers. Uh, and a natural glass that is distributed over what was the Libyan desert, if it's still there, I suppose it is. Um, 
Then, in a lot of pieces, there's extraneous material, which is encased, it's encased pale crusted material that <coughs> I think is most likely to be surface melt. When the glass was ejected, um, and I'm suggesting that if there are spheres up to a meter in diameter, this must have been ejected a long distance at a low angle, um, then it goes bounce, 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 and it picks up. And this, I really like this sea dragon. The sea dragon is a, is a very um, classical Hongshan icon. The proportions are absolutely perfect in this. It's just slightly longer from nose to tail, tip of tail than it is from top to bottom. It's almost the same. And you see here this stuff that's captured, that was clearly caught in, in the glass when it was, and it's partial melt, and that's weathered away on the right. And on, on uh, below, you see the, the, another area in close-up where you can actually see through into the glass the same material. So this must be telling us something. This little, this nice large turtle, it's about that size. They, uh, on the back, you see there's a little bit of residual encrusted material. It's like they left that as a clue to what the origin of this glass was. I mean, I think a modern carver would say it would get rid of that, but no, we just leave it, and that's all that's left after it's been weathered away. This piece, which is probably the largest of the opalescent pieces that I've got, has got the same material in the cicada, and going right into the piece. And again, it's, it's partially weathered away. So this is different material. This is not part of the original <coughs> glass. Now, how is it carved? Well, they could only carve this with an extremely hard abrasive. It has to be abraded. Um, and um, the, the, uh, um, they, they have what I call magic sand. They must have had. So what was the magic sand? Well, the first piece I got in the jade market, um, this was about 10 years ago, was this very, very humble pig dragon that, um, I mean, it, it's really not a particularly inspiring piece, but I thought it was very interesting because I hadn't seen this glass before. And you see in the top and on the next image, I've altered the color a bit on the right, there are tiny glistening microspheres, up to 100 microns in diameter. And what are these microspheres? Well, I mean, I immediately thought diamond. And I didn't know anything about impact diamonds at that stage, so I looked for diamond mines and things. But in fact, the commonest source of diamond on the planet are in, uh, is meteorite impacts, impacting graphite, carbon, and you get an immediate production of highly imperfect diamonds. And this is one of them under electron micro microscope to which I'm indebted for work with one of the labs that I've been hijacking, which is Queen Mary College Nanovision Center. And this is what it looks like. It's, 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 um, but what is it? This is about, about 30 microns across this piece, I think. And this is what it looks like under scanning, under electron, quantitative electron microscopy. There's a pure carbon peak, okay? Nothing else. The first peak doesn't count. And looking at the same thing with Raman spectroscopy, <coughs> which is much more specific, there's a peak at 1332 nanometers, which is absolutely classical for diamond. So this is pure carbon diamond. But it doesn't look a bit... The conclusion, my conclusion, is that, that, that these are impact diamonds because they don't look like synthetic diamonds, certainly. And uh, that's also called Lonsdalite. And they must have found this uh, as... Um, uh, they must have found uh, sedimentary... Just, uh, diamonds, because the density of diamond is different from silica. So they would have sedimented out. And in fact, an interesting side story is that one of the impact craters, the biggest impact craters known, is the Poppy Gray Crater in Siberia, which is 100 kilometers in diameter. And there are so many impact diamonds there that Stalin set up a gulag to mine diamonds. <laughs> they weren't very useful diamonds, and, you know, synthetic diamonds such as this are more useful. And you can see this is, gives a, a, a pure peak, but it looks completely different. So this is a synthetic, modern synthetic diamond. 